Ladies and gentlemen, you may have your attention. Welcome to Plenary 3. We're going to go ahead and get started as we have a very important visitor at the tail end of this plenary session. I hope that you enjoyed the tree planting this morning as well as that awe-inspiring Zambian Army military demonstration. If you would please join me in a round of applause for the Zambian Army. Without further ado, we'll introduce our panel on combating transnational criminal organizations. And as our panelists said yesterday, the items that we're talking about, that we talked about yesterday and we're talking about today, are interconnected. So while we're primary, primarily focused on transnational criminal organizations, there's a lot of interconnection with violent extremist organizations. But we collectively think that it's fundamentally important to understand how these organizations operate and what their features are. Our moderator will be Dr. Jeff Jackson, professor at Mount Royal University in Alberta, Canada. Dr. Jackson teaches in the fields of international relations, military history, and political science, and focuses on transnational issues that deal with peace building, governance, conflict management, and security. Dr. Jackson is also the director with the Royal Alberta United Services Institute, where his research examines security challenges such as post-conflict stabilization, climate change, and violent extreme extremism. He has worked at the Partnership Concepts and Policy Branch in the Cooperation and Regional Security Division, NATO, and as a consultant in the Regional Conflict Department, NATO. His responsibilities with NATO's Strategic Direction South, HUB, are in issues pertaining to the Sahel. The work he carries out focuses on NATO's relationships with African states and organizations and proposes new ways of cooperation in the fields of post-conflict stabilization, asymmetric warfare, and defense capability building. He holds a PhD in military and strategic studies from the University of Calgary, as well as an MA in strategic studies and a bachelor's in science and geography, and a BA in history. Dr. Jackson, thank you sincerely for your attendance. I invite you to present. Hello and welcome to the third plenary on combating tra uh, transnational criminal organizations. Really what this panel of distinguished speakers is going to be doing is showing why this topic matters to land forces. I've talked to the three distinguished panelists. Because of our time might be limited, they all wanted their bios to be very brief so that we could get to uh, the presentations and then we could get to uh, the questions and have enough time for a robust debate. First up uh, is going to be speaking is Dr. Mwibu. Um, she has carried out extensive research in Somalia and will be looking at issues of transnational crime in Eastern Africa. Brigadier General Howard uh, was the commander of the first special forces group and he is going to be talking about organized crime and finally our last speaker bigger year general dramatris he wanted me to mention he's been in a law enforcement game for a long time but he's also ran three iron men he really wanted me to make that point clear um, <laughs> uh, so our first speaker is going to be dr muibu you could come to the stage Thank you all for having me here today. Now, 
When we talk about uh, organized crime, as many of you may already be aware, a useful tool for any discussion about organized crime in Africa is the ENACT Organized Crime Index for Africa. It provides useful insights into the criminal markets, the criminal actors, as well as the state of resilience within Africa over the past five years. Now, when you look to the screen here, you can see that there are two images depicted. The one on your left highlights that the ENACT index normally captures 15 criminal markets, as well as five criminal actors. When you look to the other side of the screen, uh, you can see that the ENACT index also examines the state's ability to not only withstand, but also disrupt organized criminal activities as a whole. And they look at it through multiple different political, economic, legal, and social measures. Now, what I want to highlight is that these same uh, measures of resilience correspond very neatly to the development, security, and governance factors that generally lie as the drivers of organized crime across Africa. Now, when we're thinking about organized crime, its implications, and why is it relevant for African land forces, we must first recognize that a correlation exists between conflict and organized crime. As this map from ENACT demonstrates, that there is a geographic overlap that exists between crime and conflict hotspots, and the index goes so far to show that widespread insecurity has influenced and continues to sustain criminality patterns on the continent and vice versa. So whether we're talking about the Sahel, Central Africa, North Africa, Mozambique, or Eastern Africa, this correlation between conflict and criminality continues to exist and has important implications that should be of direct concern to African land forces for the following three reasons. The first reason is that organized crime finances the armed groups that you all are trying to fight. The second reason we should care is that organized crime affects the activities on the ground where forces are deployed, often by making those conditions more dangerous, for instance, with the flow of illicit arms. And the third reason why you need to care as land forces about organized crime is to understand that how organized crime finances the armed groups that we're fighting and how it affects the conditions on the ground by making them more dangerous helps us better understand how to be able to address those threats. And being able to address those threats pretty much demonstrates the need for land forces to better coordinate and collaborate with multiple different security actors different government actors, and different civil society actors. Now, when we think about criminality patterns across the entire continent over the past five years, what becomes clear is that criminality has increased over time. And generally, when we talk about those 15 criminal markets that I highlighted earlier on in the presentation, majority of those criminal markets increased in their prevalence across the continent. But what I want to focus my attention on for this presentation is those criminal markets that are operating or functioning in areas that are experiencing protracted conflict. So these are the criminal markets that fund the groups that we're trying to fight and that impact the conflict locations that we're trying to operate in, making them more dangerous. The first I want to tackle is human trafficking and human smuggling. We see that there's been a general increase in human trafficking and smuggling across the continent. And generally, this has been concentrated mainly in Eastern Africa, where we see the highest scores of human trafficking and smuggling and at the, both the continental level and as well as the global level. A second area where we're seeing a growth in human smuggling is in Northern Africa over recent periods of time. A second factor or market that I want to highlight is arms trafficking. This is highlighted as the third most pervasive criminal market uh, on the continent that has seen a steady increase since 2019. And the increase in arms trafficking is likely due to the flow of illicit, illicit arms from regions uh, that have experienced long-term conflict and instability, particularly Eastern Africa and Central Africa. 
Another factor worth mentioning is environmental crimes. Now, environmental crimes include everything from the trade in endangered species, to the poaching of animals, to non-renewable resource crimes like illicit mining. And this upward trajectory that we see in environmental crimes across the continent has been a much of a, a lot of a big concern in recent periods. Africa today is home to some of the highest scoring countries for non-renewable resource crimes, including areas such as Libya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Central African Republic. It's also important to note that environmental crimes that are occurring in one theater also have implications for other theaters of conflict. A useful example of this is that trafficking networks that were linked to Tanzania as well as the Democratic Republic of Congo had links to the Al-Shabaab uh, violent extremist group operating out of northern Mozambique who was estimated to have made $2 million a month from illegal logging in 2019. Another factor worth noting is drug trafficking. And so different, the trade in different uh, types of drugs, everything from cannabis to synthetic drug trade to methamphetamine trade, cocaine trade, as well as heroin trade, has seen links and, and, uh, from everywhere from northern Africa, western Africa, and eastern and southern Africa. Lastly, the last market I want to talk about that is very prevalent and present in areas that are experiencing protracted conflict is extortion and protection racketeering. Now, when we look at the averages across the entire continent for extortion and protection racketeering, we see that this has had the least influence. But when we disaggregate the, the data and look at it at a country to country level, what becomes very clear is that for certain countries, particularly Somalia and Libya, these countries have the highest score in Africa and the world for extortion and protection and racketeering that goes on to fund different armed groups that include also violent extremist groups such as Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So what can we do about this? So for countering transnational organized crime efforts to be sustainable, we need to help to address the security, development, and governance factors that lie at the root of why transnational organized crime networks survive and even thrive. The 12 resilience factors that ENACT Index captures corresponds to these three drivers. And as we examine the trends of resilience over the past five years for the continent, we see that there has been some improvements in resilience, particularly between 2001 and 2003. But, as the ENACT Index demonstrates, the gap between criminality and resilience is widening in Africa. So this suggests that despite improvements since 2001, resilience levels are simply not keeping up with the pace of the level of growth of criminality. Now, recognizing that security, governance, and development factors drive and sustain organized crime, for the remainder of this presentation, I want to discuss some existing case studies where multi-sectoral, whole-of-government efforts are underway to counter organized crime. These efforts include land forces as one among a number of actors needed to counter these threats. I will not be exhaustive or too detailed, and certainly the examples I will highlight are not perfect and have shortcomings. But in the interest of moving the conversation beyond expanding understanding of threats and towards catalyzing realistic solutions, or at least generating some conversation around solutions, I want to highlight some of the efforts that are ongoing and that move, may move us closer towards this goal. The first example I want to give is cattle rustling in the Karamoja cluster that covers Kenya, Uganda, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. This region generally has a limited government's presence, a free flow of small arms and light weapons, and an over-reliance on pastoral economies and a culture of cattle rustling. And there's been various different efforts been undertaken to be able to counter these threats. Everything from traditional peace structures, oh, sorry, to military-led uh, disarmaments and curfews, cordons and patrols, criminalization, arms embargoes, 
as well as oh, yeah, developmental measures. But all of these approaches have not necessarily been able to strategically shift the, the trajectory of conflict in the region, largely because they have been uh, poorly coordinated across the different uh, countries that make up the Karamoja cluster. But there is an opportunity that does exist. And this opportunity comes in the form of the Mifugo Protocol. The protocol stipulates procedures for prosecuting cross-border cattle rustlers. It goes so far as to cover the entire value chain of activities, including the flow of illicit arms. You know, the protocol now enables a unified approach that, facilit that facilitates prosecutions and more consistent sentences than those provided by each of the other countries' national laws. So if we ratify this protocol, it will enable security forces in each of the four countries to share information about cattle rustlers, quickly get authorization for cross-border pursuits, approach investigations from a transnational organized crime perspective that would also cover related offenses such as illicit arm flows. The second example I want to give is about illicit activities and their connection with violent extremist groups in Benin. The terrorist attacks linked to groups such as JNIM and the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara in the northern regions of Benin have been on the rise since 2019. And studies conducted by organizations such as the Institute for Security Studies have revealed that groups, these groups benefit from illicit activities that have existed in the region well before terrorist actors began, began gaining ground in those territories. And these illicit markets include fuel smuggling, drug trafficking, illegal hunting, illegal gold mining, and ammunition and arms trafficking. But where we do see an opportunity is where we is highlighted in green. And Benin has an agency for the integrated management of border spaces. It was, it was developed in 2011, and the agency spearheaded a multi-sectoral effort to build public trust in government and foster the citizen's sense of belonging in the nation. And some of the measures that they have taken and put in place include placing defense and security forces in border zones to develop trusting relations with the public, forming special units to work across the borders on transnational organized crime, providing civil legal assistance to members of the border communities, among a number of other development uh, functions. Not perfect, but certainly an area where we can see some movement. Another example that I have, at least the final one, is looking at environmental crimes in the Congo Basin. And here is where we have various armed groups and criminal groups that benefit from everything from illegal logging to poaching and illicit mining. Now the transnational nature of these crimes, which involved cross-border criminal syndicates, underscores a need for strengthened regional collaboration among security sector and criminal justice actors, among a number of other civil society actors that exist across the borders of the six countries that make up the basin. Now, I want to highlight, and this is where you can see highlighted in, highlighted in green, is that there is generally a strong level of existing commitment, both on paper as well as in practice, to facilitate coordinated efforts to counter such environmental crimes. However, though there exists a plethora of regional and at times continental institutions involved in implementing cross-border coordinated responses, they do not fully overlap. But I want to highlight a few. One is the economic community of Central African states that has a relatively new commission on environment, natural resources, agriculture, and rural development. There's also the Central African Police Chiefs Coordination Organization, the Central African Forest Commission, as well as the Lusaka Agreement Task Force. Now, examples of activities taken is that taken by CAPCO. And what you see is that this Central African Police Chiefs organi uh, Corporation organization had set forth to be able to create these mixed brigades that would include gendarmes, forest, uh, forestry sectors, customs, and public health sectors, amongst a number of other factors to be able to address cross-border trafficking. And this is just one of the examples that have been undertaken. Now, to conclude, 
The examples that I've given are, of course, not perfect, but they are at least efforts being undertaken to move things forward. Now, I want to finally conclude with three main points. Criminality is on the rise on the continent, and the gap between resilience and criminality is widening. The second point to take away is that transnational organized crime affects the conditions in the conflict locations where land forces such as yourselves are present. And funding, uh, by funding the groups that we're fighting and making the theaters more dangerous. And lastly, there's a need for more coordinated, multi-stakeholder, whole of government approaches at both the national and regional levels. Thank you so much. Can we turn this on? Can you hear me? Good. I hate podiums. If I got behind that podium, I'd go to sleep. How are we doing today? Good? General, you're not smiling. Very good. Thank you. In the back, what does RET mean there after BG? What does it mean? Retired? Are you sure? Four years ago in the Philippines, I was introduced as Brigadier General Retarded Russ Howard. The real reason that I want to emphasize that is I am retired. I speak only for myself. I don't speak for the United States government, AFRICOM, or CTAF. That's important to note because if the newspapers say something that Brigadier General Howard said, it's because that's what I said, not my government, okay? All right, here we go. I want to thank the organizers for having me here. I've known General Wassman since he was a young captain. He doesn't look a day older now than he did then. I think he invited me because I actually have pictures of him as a wild and crazy captain, so we'll see. You're very fortunate to have him as a commander, trust me. All right. So today, I'm going to give you a three-day class in eight minutes. You're fortunate in that there's no exam. All right. So. Here we go. My research interest is terrorism and counterterrorism. My research interest in criminality is criminals fund terrorists. So I'm going to talk about the nexus between criminal activity, criminal cartels, criminal traffickers, and terrorists. And that's the focus of my presentation. This is my agenda. This is the definition of nexus. Just look at the red part. That's all you need to do. Mutually beneficial interaction between criminal cartels, criminal traffickers, and terrorists. That's my whole focus. How are you today, General? Pretty good? Good. So what are the similarities between organized crime and terrorist organizations? They're both illegal. They use the same methods and tactics. Both have the same goals, some of the same goals, violence, fear, and corruption. And some, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the Albanian criminal cartel, the Georgian criminal cartel, the Chechen criminal cartel, have global reach, global reach. The similarities between criminal traffickers and terrorist organizations operate as networks, operate in denied areas. This is a little self-advertisement, something I've written about denied areas. I think it's pretty good. Both often use similar means to communicate. They exploit modern communication systems, and both launder money in much the same way. What are the differences? Terrorists in their own minds, what? They think they're altruistic. They think they're doing something positive for society. What are criminals interested in? Money. Profit. Their targets are different. Criminals use violence against police and other terrorist groups, competition. Terrorists use violence against unarmed civilians. That's the proper definition. Other definitions, 
they, it, well, as I said, the difference is motive, either political or financial. How do they cooperate? The relationships are marriages of convenience. They are not alliances. They are not alliances. Drug trafficking is an important source of income for both groups. Drug trafficking, trafficking now is the major, major income for both armed groups and uh, terrorist organizations. They learn from each other. Mexican cartels learn from Al Qaeda. They now behead their people they don't want to compete with. Government, soldiers, police. Terrorists have learned from criminal organizations. On the left, you see Al Qaeda's organization before 9 11. After 9 11, they learned to adopt non centralized organizations such as criminal cartels. What's traffic? My previous speaker did a very good job of this. I won't belabor it. Drugs, weapons, humans, commodities, cigarettes, and gold are the most trafficked items in Africa. And those all help finance terrorist organizations. I have four case studies very quickly. If you've all seen the movie Blood Diamond, you know this is a historical fact about the diamond trade financing terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda in particular. Hezbollah, big in the gold trade, still today, and the diamond trade. Present-day case study, just recently, two Lebanese were arrested in the United States for trafficking cars and cocaine for the benefit of Hezbollah. Lebanese banks play a major role in this. All this product going, cars going to Africa for sale, cocaine going to Africa for transportation to Europe. The Lake Chad Basin, Lake Chad, 1963 on the left, 2021 down below. As most of you here know, Lake Chad, when it was a large lake, provided employment for agriculturalists, fishermen, and tourists, farmers. Now, Basin is a, creating, is a hotbed for criminal and terrorist activity because it is the way that people can make a living. When Qaddafi fell, I was in Mauritania. And Americans were high-fiving with our Italian friends about Qaddafi's gone. My friends in Mauritania said, not good, not good because they knew that the weapons in Libya, once Gaddafi fell, would be trafficked out of Libya and trafficked to the rest of Africa. And that's exactly what happened. Sometimes in the West, we don't quite understand the second and third order effects of our actions. You can read that. So the nexus, criminal activity and terrorism in Africa is not few through major criminal organizations like the Chechen or uh, Georgian or Albanian or Sicilian. It's basically smaller groups presently. Mexican cartels have made inroads into Africa, particularly in Guinea-Bissau, which some people feel is a really a criminal state. They take cocaine from South America, move it to, and most of you know this, or they take South America, move it to uh, West Africa, and then take the old salt routes up north into uh, Europe. So this is the one I'm watching. I said that major organized crime like we see in the West, like the Balkan cartels, Russian cartels, that dominate our drug industry, prostitution industry, 
haven't really taken grip in Africa, but this is one that I'm watching, the black axe. See the axe and the chain? The chain is colonialism. This group started 25 years ago as a student organization and now is into credit card fraud, tax fraud, anything that has to do with technology, much different than what I have been explaining previously. So what to do? Well, one thing is to do is, like our previous speaker said, leverage our regional associations in Africa, which are primarily economically oriented. My suggestion is that they take on a security uh, portfolio. Next thing to do is interagency in a country organization. I've worked in 70, I've been, this is my 78th trip to your continent. I've been to Africa 78 times. And most times working with security services that police and military and gendarmerie don't exactly talk together. Nor do they talk to the other agencies the other ministries denying the whole of agency or whole of government approach that we advocate. So more interministerial coordination in countries and then civil military operations. If the citizenry of your country is more afraid of security services than they are of Boko Haram or Al Qaeda or ISIS or any other terrorist or criminal organization here, then your country has a problem. I just did a program in Ghana, or someone from Ghana, here a year and a half ago on civil military operations, trained civil military operators. Finally, what to do? For security services, it is much easier to penetrate a criminal cell than it is a terrorist cell. But by penetrating a criminal cell that does business with terrorists, you can often get to the terrorist organization. It's a way in. Thank you very much. I think I went nine minutes instead of eight. General Wasman, thank you again for inviting me. I had a great time. For a 77-year-old guy, I can still move. <laughs> I do okay. We could we could talk for hours, <laughs> but this is. Can I have the remote? Just thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon. Salam alaikum. Bonjour. The elephant, the cops, law enforcement. There is a need everywhere in each nation to fill a gap which, if it gets unfilled, will be filled by organized crime. Security gap or policing gap. Talk is the acronym for transnational organized crime. It's transnational by nature, by definition. However, its effects are felt locally. On the other way around, we should address talk locally at the root causes, to find the root causes, to disrupt globally organized crime. So today, being the cop, the elephant in the room, I would like to bring the military in the police dimension. Usually, in the NATO environment, I have a background in NATO. I was just to say, we bring the police dimension into the military environment. Today is the other way around. It will be crucial to understand together what we can do together. Interagency, interstate cooperation. If crime cross borders, so must law enforcement. Fighting against transnational organized crime is a struggle that knows no border. My stopwatch didn't start. My apologies. So 
to stick to the timetable. So let me set the scene one second. I will take you somewhere else from Africa. Do you know this block? I trust my colleague Justin from the UK knows him. This is uh, Mr. Sir Pedi Asdown, former special envoy of the United Nations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we are talking about 1995. I was just 25 at that time. But this says something which was crucial. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, criminals posed the greatest, the most serious threat to stability. Instead of early election, we should have posed the focus on the rule of law. This was, should have been the international priority. But let's go further east, Afghanistan. The international community praised the great success of the elections. Oh no, bombs blew off at the polls. Great success. Without mentioning that the poor Afghan people who went to the polls got stopped 200 meters from the polls by the Taliban. They checked their hands because unfortunately they couldn't write, so they were illiterate. They checked the thumbs with the ink because they expressed their vote with the ink, and they had their hands chopped by the Taliban. Was it an exercise of democracy? I think no. And what about the rule of law then? Sir Mike Jackson, the first commanding general in Kosovo, so we go back west. 1999, confrontation with the Russians, some issues, but there was still a big issue. After Timor Leste, there was, Kosovo was a mission with an executive mandate, so the rule of law was to be implemented. He was speaking about the Carabinieri, my force, a police force with military status and organization expressing civil law enforcement capability, as the gendarmerie, so I mentions. Anyway, he said that we are talking about just soldiers with the mindset of cops, simply like that. They are fully interoperable. Uh, Daisy spoke about interoperability with the military. We have the same TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and we use the same weaponry. So we can work together, hands in hands. Something else, going back to Afghanistan. Osna Jalil, she was the, pre the first female in the government, in the Afghan government. She was 29 when she was elected, nominated Deputy Minister for Interior. I had the opportunity to work, to work with her, and she focused on the crime-related crime death toll in Afghanistan. It was 150 slash 200 percent higher than the terrorist-related death. But the international community and the Afghan government focus on the so-called counter insurgency or terrorism operations. With a light footprint approach on law enforcement, and uh, we ended up with the police supporting the military in counter insurgency operations and dedicating just the 15 percent of their forces in community-oriented policing. Cigar, you don't smoke the cigar, is the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, a United States auditing body of the Congress. I happen to cooperate with them on a report, Policing in Conflict, and the findings are a little bit scary. So, critical golden hour, when you deploy your troops, six to 12 months after a ceasefire or a peace agreement. I know, we are talking about peacekeeping here, but wait a moment. The United Nations estimates that to deploy a mission, a police assistance mission, it takes nine to 12 months. We have been uh, busy with Haiti. You heard about it. The Security Council resolution dates the 2nd of October, 2023, first four minutes when go, when pass it by. And we do not have the draft of the CONOPS yes, yet. Run corporation, this is more scary. After the Second World War, societies recovering from war relapsed into war, most of them. Half of them, half, 50% of them, within five years. One-fifth within one year. Afghanistan, nine days. Why? Lots of people wrote about it, but what about the rule of law? Cops, courts, and correction. The only definition about this gap, the policing gap, is in NATO. So I'm not bragging about NATO, I'm just saying that NATO understood the importance 
of policing in destabilized environments, so not only peacekeeping operation, destabilized environment. It's a gap that you can see from two different perspectives, capacity and capabilities, lack of capacity but capability, the that line, and the, the real needs of the local population, we do not, which we do not manage to fulfill. If we do not fulfill these needs, as the professor, Brigadier General Russell Howard said, somebody else will do it. The terrorists of organized crime. It happens everywhere, also in Fortress Europe, as somebody mentioned, and in my own country. I can give you plenty of examples. How the United Nations and the international community try to approach the phenomenon of transnational organized crime through the Palermo Convention, 15 November 2000 the United Nations Transnational Organized Crime Convention. However, we don't have a definition of transnational organized crime. We know that a serious crime, however, is a crime which can be punished with a penalty of at least four years' imprisonment. And then, as you see, there are criteria to establish which are, what, what is an organized criminal group? So, at least three persons, they have to be permanent together, they want to do at least one serious crime, apart from petty crimes, maybe, but usually they are very serious, heinous crime, I would say, and then they, have a, they want a profit, material or financial. So we don't have a definition, but look at it, how many possible understanding of talk. Talk exploits poorest borders. Everywhere there is a seam, they will sneak in. Terrorism as well. They exploit also regulatory gaps between countries. So neighboring countries must cooperate. Otherwise, they will be, the, the, the criminals will be in a safe haven. This foster impunity, but it, this uh, jeopardizes, undermines the legitimacy of your institutions. So can we afford that human rights are infringed every now and then? Can we afford that human security is underestimated by our uh, institution? Can we afford to fail in developing, in bringing about long-term peace developing in our countries, can we afford to leave these people committing any kind of violence and uh, fuel corruption? Yesterday I heard an awful lot of colleagues talking about corruption, but what can we do to, to better our countries? When I wake up, you know, JFK will say, well, think about what you can do for your country, not what, for what about what your country can do for you. So, talk is multifaceted, is global, is enduring challenge. But to counter talk, we must have a multifaceted approach and enduring legal weapons. Legal weapons means last four minutes and it's gone. So, <laughs> triathlon helps. And then, uh, what about scarcity of police on the borders? Yesterday I heard a colleague talking about scarcity of police on the borders. And when you do not have enough police, you need to support them in controlling the borders. And your borders are far different from mine. I have sea and mountains in Italy. You have sometimes plain. That's it. It's far more difficult. You need drones, you need any kind of equipment to control, but also patrol. We cannot afford to leave any safe haven. We must not leave any quarters to the criminals. This is the approach, it's very ag aggressive. So we, let's we see what is the perspective of the United Nations on transnational organized crime. It's a peace spoiler, Every, it's a given, we know, because they fuel corruption. They allow, they are good also at exploiting an overlap between war and crime. Sometimes it's very difficult to understand it. Is it a criminal act or is it an act of war? Does it fall within the Con Geneva Convention or not? Or can we take these people before the prosecution? Do I have the legal framework to do it? And then, uh, every time there is a void, we spoke about a void, a gap. Every time somebody will exploit it. To think about also natural resources. Daisy, you spoke about it. Logging, poaching, illicit mining. And what about trafficking in waste? Pollution, yes, we spoke about environmental protection. So the United Nations is taking a, a keen eye on this, and for years has been working on developing the capacities of the, the, the recipients of the country, 
to several projects, the Transnational Tra Threat Project, you can see in the slide, the West Coast Africa Initiative, they are working on intelligence on also building the capacity to fight violent extremism, organized crime, talk, I will say, and corruption. We must build the integrity of our institution. And then the cooperation with the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime and Interpol, which are the most important police international organization that deal with the subject matter. So we cannot ignore talk. What is, where is the problem? The United Nations systems understand the importance of talk. What about member states? Do they turn a blind eye as it happened in Afghanistan, where the international community didn't give a strong mandate, the light, the light footprint approach to the international community? There are three countries, only three missions mandate, which speak about organized crime talk in the in in ONU, within the United, United Nations. Mali, Central Africa, and Congo. But they just touch upon the issue. Can we afford it, or do we have to ask our politicians to be a little bit more courageous to provide the United Nations with this more robust mandate? So, which are the key strategies to fight talk? This comes from my experience. I've been in the law enforcement industry since ever. So, there's no enemy. Who is the enemy? Let's exploit also undercover operation. It's difficult to infiltrate terrorism, but you can still use an awful lot of devices to listen what to do, they do. For sure, it's far easier to infiltrate organized crime because you do not have to convert possibly on an orthodox, on extremist vision of your religion. But crucial is community-oriented policing. The cop on the beat. We must talk to the population. Take out the sunglasses and talking to people, to the kids in the villages, to the elders. We must establish a contact with them. Win hearts and mind. It's over. So it's both domestically and internationally. We have to carry out intelligence-led policing operation, joint operation with the other countries, with the other police forces. We do need a legal framework, but we do need also to be very aggressive with the money. We must be proactive. We must hit the financial heart of the organized crime, criminal organization. If we do, fail to do so, they will flourish. If we, if we cut the ties with money, they will do nothing. This comes from our experience, from my experience in Italy. The two phases that they are coming out are the phases of two prosecutors killed by mafia with roadside bombs. Follow the money and we, you will disrupt organized crime. Technology, let's have the hedge and we'll win also on this battlefield. And lastly, interagency cooperation. Judge Falcone Borsellino, I move to tears every time I see them. I was a lieutenant when they died. We are closing to a end. Interagency cooperation is crucial. It fosters info sharing, but also allows law enforcement to get more power. Think about the custody chain when we retrieve important pieces of evidence. Or think also about law enforcement intelligence. So don't think only about a, the green intelligence, but there is also a blue approach on the facts. And the commander on the ground needs both flow of information because the police carry out investigation, but gathers also information and develop intelligence. Lastly, this improves cooperation and complementarity. Last slide. We need a paradigm shift. We cannot kill at will. We must not only neutralize our opponents, adversaries, non enemies, because we must support the rule of law, cops, courts, and correction, because the strategic communication is to be improved, because we need long term effect to minimize use of force to minimize collateral damage. We must arrest people rather than killing them on the stop spot or capturing them, because we need to bring them before justice. And we must consolidate our battlefield gains. Also, the military support some very heavy organized crime operations. So we, we must not just win the battle and then retrieve. We must consolidate these gains.
If we prosecuted criminals rather than neutralizing them, we will for sure win the battle of narratives. We must, in this way, foster legitimacy of the institutions and resilience of the society. In this way, we protect state vulnerabilities below the threshold of war. There is the last picture for you, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies. Do you know the map in the center? It's Pinocchio. Everybody knows Pinocchio, the map, the wooden map. Arrested by two carabinieri. Why the writer Collodi has chosen the carabinieri to arrest Pinocchio? In a very large island in Italy, Sardinia, beautiful but very wild, talking about organized, not organized crime, but criminality, the carabinieri are called the justice the epitome of justice, but we are cops, we are not the courts. So, this is the aim of any kind of police force, to be acknowledged as an institution which delivers justice. We cannot be hatred, as uh, Professor Howard said. The most hatred institution in Afghanistan, this is the Seagal report, was police, not the Taliban. I do thank you for your attention pending your questions. I didn't speak about my set. Oh, perfect. Those were three fantastic uh, presentations on organized crime. Some of the conclusions that I took away from the talk with Dr. Mouibouz is that criminality is on the rise in the continent and she used case studies from East Africa and around the Sorrel to prove that point, Sahel to prove that point. And the gap between resilience and criminality in her case studies is seen to be widening. To combat effects of the conditions in the conflict locations where land forces are present, funding groups, um, we are fighting in making the theaters more dangerous, that we have to have different approaches to deal with this criminality and rise of it. Finally, the final point that she made was there's a need now for more coordinated multi-purpose stakeholders, whole, group, whole government group approaches at the national and regional level. And this was something all three panelists focus on. Brigadier General's talk on organized crime also reached some of those similar conclusions. There needs to be more interministerial coordination. Regional security isn't just economic cooperation. There needs to be more in-depth and detailed relationships. Civil military cooperation makes our citizens, makes the citizens of the regions trust the security services more than criminals and terrorist organizations that are working there effectively. Now, our final presentation looked at how can we help the police services? How can we help engage them? What role does the land force have moving forward? And once again, there was this rising theme of interagency cooperation. That organized crime is a link in a way into terrorism. If we put the resources within trying to locate organized crime, having combating it, we are going to be able to move forward and address the terrorist uh, issues that are rising. Um, only by moving forward in a unified front, working together interagencies, will this be able to make a difference.